All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to this online workshop for best practices for documenting social science research data. My name is Maureen Haker and I am a um, senior qualitative research data officer at the UK Data Archive. I've worked um, with um, with the UK Data Archive for over 10 years now on everything from ingesting some of our collections um, and curating those to reuse projects. Um, I also kind of wear another hat. I work with um, University of Suffolk, where I teach research methods um, and sociology of childhood. Um, so today we're going to be talking about documentation. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, this is a little bit of an overview of what we're going to do today. We'll start with the basics. So what is documentation? Why is it important? And there is some discussion on FAIR principles as well. And then from there, we're going to talk about metadata. Um, and this is really what the core of what documentation is. Um, and then we'll move into some examples of data level documentation and then study level documentation um, with a distinction a little bit there between what is some of the common documentation for qualitative projects and what is some of the documentation for quantitative projects. Um, and as I said before, there are a couple of exercises which should give you an opportunity um, to look at some more examples and, and think about what kind of documentation you might be able to include with your project. So briefly, I just wanted to go back to define documentation um, and, and specifically those types of documentation that I said we'll be covering. So I said data level documentation and study level documentation. Study level documentation is also sometimes called project level documentation. And those are the terms that are used by the UK Data Service. Um, data level documentation provides information about data objects. So this could be variable information that's embedded in a data file. It could be demographic details of a participant who took part in an interview. Study level documentation, however, is information about the broader research project. So what kind of methods were used? There might be summaries of, of findings. Um, so we'll, we'll go through some examples of each of these so you can kind of see what they look like in action. But these aren't the only terms that are used to describe documentation. Okay, I so said those are the terms UK Data Service use. So all this material, basically, that, that comes from your research is called different things by different policies. So archives, like the UK Data Service, will call it documentation. And under documentation, we have those specific kinds. Um, so you might have also heard words like user guides, data lists, data dictionaries, um, and I have examples of all of those today. Um, there's also things like readme files, um, which you may have been asked to write if you've ever deposited data with us. Um, some policies, like the ESRC's data policy, refers to research materials, which doesn't really have a specific definition as such, but rather it kind of refers to anything that might have been used across the research project. Um, it also refers to data assets, which is a system that is used to hold data. And then of course, there's also metadata um, and the kind of specific, I don't know if this is the right analogy, but sort of the brand name types of, of metadata like DDI. So I'm gonna talk about DDI today. It's a specific schema of metadata that gives you a very distinct vocabulary when you're describing your data. So while the concept of documentation is clear, the deeper you go, the deeper some of those um, ideas run. And if you are interested in exploring some more of the terminology, CoData has a working group um, which is dedicated to terminology and guidance on that terminology. But hopefully some of these practical examples will give you an idea of what it is we're talking about, even if you are using um, different kinds of language to describe it. So now you know what documentation is and the different levels um, and are hopefully starting to see how embedded some of these are in doing and disseminating research. But why do we do it? Um, documentation from the point of an archive maximizes the reuse value of data, and it's also essential for us to review and publish the data. 
So you can't understand data without documentation. If you just dropped an interview transcript in the middle of the street and someone picked it up, they can't really understand the data without understand the, understanding the context um, that was used to, to sort of gather that data. And this also adds to the historical value of the data. It, it builds a bit of a providence around the data. Documentation also helps you expand on the methods and the processes um, that might not normally get covered in a publication. So there's no, there's no limitation to the kind of space that you can use for documentation. So you can really add anything that you think is useful for understanding the data. Doing so will also help you enhance your research outputs. So documentation becomes an output in and of itself. And that documentation, as we'll see at the end of this workshop, can also be reused. Um, it also adds a layer of transparency to research. So as part of the peer review process, reviewers can better understand the work of the data um, and, and uh, the work of the reusers, and they can also more accurately and efficiently reuse that data. Finally, it aids the creation of FAIR research. So I'm going to talk about FAIR data in just a moment, but um, um, I do want to just talk through a, a kind of example of why documentation is so important. So I just want you to imagine for a moment, you're looking at this table here. Can you understand what the data represents? We might be able to guess the meaning of these, and we probably get, a, get an idea, maybe these Vs stand for variables, and obviously we have some numbers. And if you know enough about um, survey research, you might even look at these and start to think, I could probably guess maybe what that could be asking, but actually this is in and of itself not very useful as a data set. But by adding some additional metadata, the data table is suddenly transformed and the usability has dramatically increased. However, we're still missing some important pieces of contextual information. So what else might help us make sense of this? Um, and you probably already have some ideas running through your head of what that might be. Um, and so here we have some additional metadata and that provides information about the units in which the numerical data um, is presented it, it, what it is, um, and it also makes that data much easier to interpret. Um, so what I like about this is, is kind of not just how this metadata can help kind of you see what it is that that data is meant to be, what it's meant to describe um, and represent, but also it might help you reflect on your own positionality. What did you think the data was versus what it is? Um, and it might, you know, some of those guesses that you make might reveal something about yourself as well um, in relation to that data. Okay, so hopefully that was a clear demonstration of how context can matter and how it can change your perception of data. But why share the documentation and data? And this particular point is one of the key underpinning principles to FAIR data. So FAIR principles are uh, relatively new guidelines or maybe goals perhaps of research, which aim to make research more transparent, collaborative and constructive. Since the early 2000s, technology has had a massive impact on how research is done. So we can collect more data, which is more complex and we share it quicker um, than we've ever been able to before. However, despite collecting so much data all the time, we still have challenges to processing that data. So just think about any organization where data is not shared between departments and you have to constantly kind of re-enter the same information again and again. Um, so how do we solve this? Well, in 2016, Wilkinson et al. published the FAIR principles, which outlined what good data management looked like um, that would enable the sharing and reuse of data. And the key here is to make data machine readable, to, um, to um, <clears throat> so sorry, I have, I'm just getting over a cold, so I just have a tickle in my throat. One moment. <clears throat> I'm just going to take a sip of water. 
So the idea behind these FAIR principles is to be able to use technology, um, which would in effect change the way that research is done and how we can reuse that data. So those guidelines were so influential that an international collaboration between the GoFair International Support and Coordination Office um, kind of sprung up just a year after those guidelines were published. And those FAIR principles continue to influence policies. So you'll see FAIR references in data policies of the Research Data Alliance, of the Association of European Research Libraries, um, the UKRI and all of its, its associated research councils within the UK. And if you do receive grant or taxpayer money to complete research, chances are you are going to be asked to share the data and the documentation at the completion of your project. Many publishers are now also requiring the sharing of data and research materials before publication in the name of transparency and research rigor. The FAIR principles laid out here state that data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So research is not just something that you complete in you know, the solitude of academic offices, but it's something that is completed in collaboration with others and, and shared for future reuse. To make data fair, however, also means documenting the data. Um, <clears throat> to make data findable and accessible requires very clear metadata. Equally, to make data reusable means documenting the provenance, the history of that data. So I'm not going to go much further into the FAIR principles here. Um, but if you have any questions about it, please do send that through the Q&A. Happy to have a look at those. Um, but I did want to point something out uh, uh, about this sort of description of the FAIR principles. Um, and it's something that spans across all four of these. And that's metadata. So metadata really is the root of what is documentation. It helps describe the data in catalog pages from the point of a, an archive. It helps describe participants for reusers. Um, and it helps also to describe the methods. So there's a lot of grassroots work that has been done to build up what we call schemas of metadata um, and to, to try and synchronize some of these descriptions. So we're gonna expand a little bit more on metadata and I'm gonna introduce you to DDI. Um, so metadata, I'm gonna cover um, what qualifies as good metadata, what are some of the standards, how is it produced? Um, and again, we're starting here with metadata because all documentation, regardless of what level it is, is in a sense metadata. But what is metadata? The best definition I think I've heard of metadata is that it is data about data. So essentially it is information that describes and explains the data. Usually when we talk about metadata though, we're talking about standardized structured information. And the idea behind the standardization is that that's what makes it machine readable. So if you go to our cat, uh, data catalog and you start searching for data, our catalog is reading through the standardized metadata on the catalog pages to help bring back the results. Because metadata is basically what underpins all of archive cataloging, um, <clears throat> the citing of metadata, uh, sorry, the citing of our, our collections as well is underpinned by metadata. So discovering and retrieving those data collections all rely on structured and standardized metadata. So basically you need metadata in order to find collections. Um, and so good complete metadata becomes very important for the reuse um, of data. Importantly though, metadata should be collected and recorded throughout the research data life cycle. It's not simply something that you should think about as you're depositing a data set or as you're looking at reusing a data set. Instead, you should be thinking about each step of creating, preserving, and reusing data and thinking about what metadata is available at that stage and what might enhance the collection. But what does metadata actually depict? Um, all of the metadata aims to answer the sort of journalistic five W's and one H of data. So who created it? Um, what does the data file contain? 
um, when and where was the uh, data uh, created, um, why was the data created, and how was the data created. So we have lots of examples of how this is done in practice, but overall the key question is, what would someone with no prior knowledge about the project and data need to be able to understand or use that data correctly in their own research? Some of the metadata that we capture on the UK Data Service um, catalog pages includes these fields. So you have things like the abstract, you have a set of keywords and topics, um, and all of this information in our catalog is based on a standardized schema. So you search through and select a list of keywords and topics, dates of, of field, um, field work, the country information about the sample, including the observation and analytic units, um, information about the population, the number of your sample. Um, there's also information collected about the methods, the, the kind of data and the weighting. Um, so all of this would sort of be from a, a pre-selected kind of categories. But if we're collecting this information, or perhaps you tacitly know this information from actually doing the research, um, why, why have I said it needs to be structured? Structured metadata, or metadata that is standardized and uses a schema to guide its description, um, is, is actually really important. So by using the structured metadata, it establishes how one piece of information relates to other pieces of information and it also makes it easier, as I said before, for computers to automatically extract that information. This is obviously helpful for archives looking to increase findability of data collections, but it's also a useful comparative to see how your research fits within the larger field. It helps you find background literature um, or data even to build context around your research questions. Um, and the information provides context that might influence the decisions that you make in your analysis. So even if it's not something that you have in the past kind of typically gathered um, and recorded, it is something that you have probably implicitly used throughout the research process. So what are metadata standards and who decides what these are? A metadata standard provides the framework to establish a common set of characteristics or attributes of data. So these are very standardized from the language, the spelling, and the format. All of that is taken into account when setting these standards. If everybody used a different standard, it makes it very difficult to find and or compare data from different sources. So a metadata standard is a requirement which is intended to establish a common understanding of the meaning um, or the semantics of the data and it ensures the correct and proper use and interpretation of that data by its owners and users. But there are different standards that are, you know, sometimes reflect disciplinary differences. So consequently, sometimes it's necessary for translation programs to map between those standards to allow for better findability. So metadata standards allow for data discovery and access, the consequent reuse of the data, the interoperability of systems. So being able to use data across different systems and programs um, is what I mean by interoperability. Um, it allows you to share the data across communities as well, whether those communities are data providers like archives and data users, or perhaps just different types of users, perhaps people across different disciplines. Um, and there are a number of metadata schemas that can be used. However, for those who are doing research in social sciences, DDI is a schema that's commonly used. Um, and it's also what the UK Data Service uses to underpin our data catalog. So DDI or the Data Documentation Initiative is a rich and detailed metadata standard, which has been developed by the DDI Alliance. So there's a couple of different versions of DDI, the DDI Codebook and the DDI Lifecycle. So DDI Codebook 
gathers more basic information, and it's often used to describe collections at a much higher level. So it's really useful in, for example, our data catalog. DDI lifecycle, on the other hand, is a little bit more complex, and it allows you to describe, for example, survey questions and variables in addition to that basic catalog information. DDI lifecycle um, might be particularly useful if you're looking at longitudinal studies where similar questions or variables might be reused across survey waves. Um, and it allows for you to identify and compare uh, responses of the same variables. So just to point out, there are a lot of different types of metadata standards and schemas. Some have very specific uses, and you can use more than one standard to help you describe your data. Um, and you may also be able to map or translate across different standards. If you are planning to archive data, you will need to provide metadata to describe it. So I'm just, this is just scrolling through um, one of what one of our catalog pages looks like. So you can kind of see what kind of metadata is gathered. <clears throat> um, so again, this, this helps you add information um, about your data and its provenance. Um, and, you know, behind all of our catalog uh, pages is all of this metadata. So, and this is all within DDI compliant um, kind of elements. So at the UK Data Service, our DDI records contain both mandatory and optional metadata on things like the study description. Um, so this is information about the context of the data collection. Um, and it might also be like a bibliogra um, bibliographic uh, citation of the study. Um, you might have the scope of the study. So you would have seen on the previous um, kind of scroll down some topics, some geography, time. You'll have information about the methodology of data collection, including sampling and processing. Um, there's information about the data access and any kind of accompanying materials. You'll also have data file descriptions. So this is information about the data format, the file type, the file structure, if there's missing data or weighting variables. Um, there will also be variable descriptions. And then there is keywords. So it's really good practice to use a thesaurus, such as um, the ones that you see here, here, the Humanities and Social Science Electronic Thesaurus, or its multilingual sister, the European Language Social Science um, Thesaurus. So these are controlled vocabularies. So when you get to the point of, um, sorry, let me just go back. When you get to the point of kind of selecting what some of your keywords are um, or what some of the topics are, these are coming from controlled vocabularies. Um, so this is in addition to the DDI structure of the metadata for our catalog pa uh, pages. So <clears throat> these controlled vocabularies basically mean these aren't just free text fields where you can write in any kind of topic or keyword that you want. These are set vocabularies, which again, have very distinct kind of spelling and formats um, and, and basically semantics. But while we use the Humanities and Social Science Electronic Thesaurus, um, and it, indeed, if, you, if you're working in the social sciences, this is probably the one you'd want to use. It's not the only one that you can use. Um, so I just want to take a few minutes now. Um, and Emma, if you're able to pop the um, website into the chat, um, but you can go to bartalk.org and search for some controlled vocabularies based on your discipline. So um, when you get to this web page, you'll see there's this really tempting search bar. You can just type in perhaps what your discipline is or if there's a more specific kind of topic that you research um, and it will pull up the listings of controlled vocabularies and gives you a little bit of information about each of those such as where it was developed um, and, and who controls those controlled vocabularies. So there's a little bit of documentation with each controlled vocabulary as well. So I'm just gonna set a timer um, and I'm gonna give you a few minutes with this um, and I'm gonna check that chat and see if there's if there's um, anything coming through for me. Um, but have a, little, have a little browse around and see what kind of vocabularies you come up with.
Okay, so somebody's asked, do repositories like Figshare use these metadata standards? And if we use them for our research, can we say that we're following the FAIR principles? Um, it's a really good question because different archives will have different standards that they use. So there are common ones, like I said, UK um, Data Service uses <clears throat> DDI, which probably is one of the more popular ones among um, archives within the social sciences, but there's no set kind of, you must follow this standard per se. So other repositories like Figshare um, may or, or may not, I need to actually have a look at Figshare and see what it is they set up. But when you deposit your data, um, if you find that they have mandatory fields that you have to fill in, and those are, you know, preset, they will be following some kind of standard, basically. Um, and it is worth considering how you are able to describe and share your metadata as openly as possible. So using the FAIR principles can certainly help with that. Um, and there are other tools such as metadata profiles, which are available for you to help you decide on what is the important metadata elements to include when describing your study. Um, so if, if you are depositing with somewhere like Figshare, you know, kind of scrutinize that a little bit and think about, well, what kind of metadata are they asking of me? Um, if you use something like a trusted repository, like the UK Data Service, they will have a standard that they set and, and it probably will be something specific to uh, the, the discipline. All right, so um, if we just uh, move on, I'm gonna go through the different types of documentation and this is basically just gonna give you um, some visuals of what the different kind of documentation we collect is. Um, so just as a, a brief overview, data level documentation is all about the specific data files within your collection. So this relates not to the whole collection, but to specific data files, which could be, for example, a single interview transcript, could be an SPSS file, or it could be a single image. Um, often this kind of metadata is embedded within the data file. Um, and sometimes you collect this information as a standard part of, of the research process. Um, so you probably have this kind of documentation, whether or not you, you kind of called it that is, is, um, is I suppose a different question. Um, it's worth noting, however, that if you are depositing your data somewhere and you've embedded that metadata in the data file, Usually there's some sort of safeguard, like if you're using the UK data service, something like 90 to 95% of our collections are safeguarded. So that means that someone would need to register um, with us and sign our end user license in order to access that data, which means they can't access the metadata without first registering with, with us as well. Um, so it's just something to bear in mind. Um, you can include this separately. Um, and if that's the case, you can you know, make it available as an open uh, document. So you don't need to register, um, but if it's embedded, it would be hidden behind uh, with the data if the data is safeguarded. So in survey data, <clears throat> um, data level documentation tends to be very structured. And if you're using a program like SPSS, the software is designed for you to, to add that metadata um, before you even begin the analysis. So that metadata then is an example of the uh, uh, metadata that's embedded in the data. Um, for variable names, for example, there needs to be some sort of question number system which matches the question in the questionnaire. Um, if there's a numerical system that's used, it should be clear what that system is and how it relates to the questionnaire or um, the variable names that are used. There should be meaningful abbreviations such as, you know, GOR, for example, for government office region. Um, there should be consistency in the naming conventions across the entire project, especially where there's different data, data sets across the project. Um, and finally, for interoperability ac across platforms, variable um, names should be no longer than eight characters and should not have spaces. Um, following similar principles for variable names, the variable labels, 
um, should be brief and concise, no more than 80 characters. Where it's applicable, they should use a unit of measurement. And again, if applicable, describe the coding or the classification system used and include a reference. So for example, if you're using the standard occupational classification 2000, SOC 2000, um, to describe a social class, make sure that that reference is kind of built in somewhere into the variable label. And finally, include a reference to the question in the survey or questionnaire. So um, the example that I have here does all of that. So Q9B hex W is um, given to the label Q9B hours spent taking physical exercise in a typical week. So that clearly includes the unit of measurement, a reference and a reference to the question. So not only does this make it easier for reusers, but I expect this would also make it really um, easy for you as well during the initial analysis. Um, and you should add value labels as well and make sure that there's nothing that's out of bounds for those um, uh, values for categorical variables. So avoid having blanks as well. So instead of just sort of, you know, one kind of classification of missing data, perhaps think about a more nuanced differentiation there of not recorded, not provided, not applicable, not known. Um, <clears throat> So there's a lot of different ways to label um, that. So thinking about that level of nuance as well is really helpful. And for those of you who use um, SPSS, this uh, should hopefully look a bit familiar as a variable view. So that shows you the variable um, name and label, and um, you can see that there's the unit of measurement um, is accounted for, as well as some of the um, missing values. Likewise, if you go into the variable values, you can see what kind of um, information um, is, is uh, specified for that particular, uh, particular variable. And we do a similar sort of thing for qualitative work as well. So quantitative kind of takes all of that metadata as, as sort of part and parcel of the, the process of collecting um, data, but we, we can do this with qualitative work as well. So with transcripts, data level documentation is usually included at the start of each of the interview, certainly for what we ingest and curate within our um, main collection. Um, you'll see this kind of format. Um, uh, so we have here the name of the collection, the PI, plus demographic details about the participant, including, for example, their sex, their socioeconomic status, the region that they're from, and the details that you want to include in here can vary based on what characteristics you might think are particularly important or influential within your study. Images, similarly, will have metadata about the image itself. Now, I should say the UK Data Service does not have many collections with images. Um, they, they do take up a lot of space. Um, and there are some lingering issues around anonymization that, you know, we need to deal with. Um, and it, depending on the anonymization strategy, it, it begins to impact the usefulness of the image if you have to blur everything out. Um, but we do have some, including these images from our Edwardians collections. Um, so in this collection, the images were taken of people who live, who were born during the Edwardian period. So sufficient time has passed where we can release these images. Um, and in these, we usually um, include a caption, which describes the photo itself, a bit like an alt text, um, including anything particularly notable about the image. And you may also want to include some historical notes to help contextualize that image. You can also record characteristics like the region, the year it was taken, who it was taken by, um, if you think that those are important elements to know. So all of that is really useful metadata um, to help you make sense of that image at a later date. So study or project level, depending on what word you wanna use, provides quite high level information on the research context and design, uh, the data collection methods used, any data preparation and manipulation. And there might also be things like summaries or findings that are based on the data. So we're gonna go through some examples of these. 
And the big one that we kind of put together is called a user guide. So a user guide is a key piece of documentation that sits alongside the data collection, and it includes further information about the methods and the field work. It includes all this information together in a single document, and that is normally available openly because it's a separate document from the data itself. So you can make that openly available. Um, and that just means no one would have to register in order to, to view it. Um, so looking at the user guide alone, uh, you'll probably be able to start unpicking some of the intricacies of the collection and think about what some of the opportunities might be in that data collection. Um, user guides do look different across collections. There's no standard specific template as such, but rather it's tailored to what information is available and what the specifics are of that particular collection. So I'm not going to go through these three um, uh, uh, user guides, but I just kind of collected them here on this slide. If you wanted to have a look at them, they are very different looking user guides. So you can kind of see the variability um, of them. Um, and I do have a couple of screenshots to kind of give you a glimpse into what some of these user guides look like when you open them. So within collections that are curated by the UK Data Archive, these materials are collated into a single PDF document. And that, that user guide is then bookmarked. So you can see here on the right-hand side of the, the screenshot, there's some bookmarks there that tell you what materials are available within that user guide. Um, you are, you know, there are some collections that have been deposited within our self-deposit system, the reshare, and in some of those, you're more likely to see a folder of documents or separate files um, that have been deposited by the researchers rather than a single PDF. So just be aware, it, it, you know, if it's curated by us, you'll see it as a single document. If it's curated by the researcher, um, using reshare, it may be that they are still in separate files. So this particular user guide is an example of a survey. Um, so again, you can see what's sort of bookmarked there. Um, and it, you know, that basically that bookmarking acts as a map to talk you through the preparation and delivery of the survey, as well as any other information you might need to know. So here you can see there's information about the sample and the questionnaire the data structure, even how to cite that user guide. Um, in addition to what you saw in that example, other key documentation for surveys include things like technical reports, information leaflets and protocols, blank questionnaires with code books and, and survey instructions, coding frames, um, any information about known errors or any issues with the data. And qualitative collections also have user guides. So like this one that you can see here, and this time the bookmarks are on the left-hand side. Um, but this one shows an interview topic guide along with the final report that was done for the project. There's a blank consent form. There's more information about the sample. Um, so all of that gets, again, collated into a single PDF. And here's some examples of documentation for qualitative work. Basically, all the information you probably create along the way of doing research, but never usually gets seen outside of the research team and maybe some of the participants. So it can include interview preparation, including instructions to interviewers, prompts or topic guides, blank consent forms, information sheets, any other materials that the par participant might receive prior to taking part. It could also include text written by expanding on the methodology or sampling. Um, so this could include things like documentation from the analysis, like memos or code books or some initial write-ups. Um, in the 1,500 or so collections of qualitative research, um, I have to say we don't often, within qualitative collections, we don't often see documentation on analysis. Um, uh, that would obviously help reusers better understand some of the decisions that were made in the analysis um, or perhaps not made. Um, and that context, I think, can be really, really important to qualitative work. 
Um, we see it more as a standard within quantitative work. So you'll often get the syntax, the kind of code um, that somebody has written up to actually do the statistical analysis. So that often gets, as a standard, gets deposited with quantitative. But we don't really have a qualitative um, equivalent of that. Um, but it is something you could include if you wanted to. Um, and here's an example um, of rather than being a single document within a user guide, documentation that has remained separated into different documents. So you can see anti-politics characterizing and accounting for political dissatisfaction has included their, this is a mixed methods. Um, so it's got the survey questionnaire as well as end of award report. And they did some focus groups. So there's the consent form, the participant information sheet and focus group resources. All of this is included. Um, it's just in different files. As an alternative to embedded metadata, you can also have a structured document um, that lies separate from the data. Um, so this would be in a code book or a data dictionary. And that usually includes detailed and sufficient information about the data items, including variables, new and derived, frequencies, command files that might be used to create derived variables. We also have um, some codebook creation tools. So there's the DDI editor, which is aimed at data processing for curation purposes. So this can be used prior to depositing your collection in the archive. And there's also the Nestar publisher. There is quite a lot of um, information existing about th these uh, programs and how to use them. So just give them a Google um, and you should be able to find some more uh, information about those. But just having a look at some of those uh, types of documentation. So this is a code book. This one is from our Understanding Society teaching data set. And you can see here there's a variable name, the label, and where applicable options for responses or, or the range of responses that have been um, included in the data. So unlike the embedded metadata that was shown earlier in the SPSS files, this codebook can be um, deposited separately um, and put, you know, and be put out openly as well. Data dictionaries are very similar to codebooks, and the terms are often used interchangeably. Um, and those also sit within the study level documentation. Often the data dictionary, however, in a difference from, from um, a code book, will contain more information about the structure of the database. So you can see here, they've documented that the variable is numeric and a scale level of measurement. So data dictionaries tend to have the most information. Um, in addition to the user guide, the UK Data Archive also curates a data list um, which gives you an at-a-glance look at participants. So this would probably be considered more of a um, data level documentation where you have metadata, including basic demographic details about each participant and the file name where you can find that relevant data. Um, but it's also, it, it, it's also kind of study level because it's the whole collection. Um, so while one row might be data level documentation, when you've got it all together in a data list, it's it's um, a project level. These can take a little bit of time to assemble, but they're really useful organizational tools during research. So it's really good practice to create one as you go, um, but it's, it's just a good at a glance look at who participated um, in, the, in the study. There are other types of documentation um, that I'm gonna go through some examples now, um, such as this one, which is observations that are written by researchers in the moment of data gathering. So some types of methods might dictate some time to kind of self-reflect as part of the method. Um, and this might even be used as data. So there is a um, project by Ross Edwards where she was looking at what we call this as paradata, the kind of data that sits alongside the data. Um, to kind of unpick how we do surveys and what, you know, how questions are formed and what the limitations are of some of those. Um, this particular example is a, a little bit more of a, a, a deeper reflection there, 
by interviewers of Affluent Worker, which was research that was used to create our ONS categories of uh, class. So they help contextualize the relationship between the researcher and the participant. And it can be a really helpful data level documentation. It is really unusual to see something like this. Um, and it might veer into the scope of being data in and of itself. So it's kind of being aware of what kind of information is being held within those um, and whether or not they should be something that is more safeguarded. Um, a step further than some of those reflections might be something like this, which is draft work of the analysis. So this is from Dennis Marsden's collection, Mother Alone, Mothers Alone. So this is a piece called Felt Poverty, um, which never made it to publication, but it clearly informed um, some of the publications as well. So this ended up getting included in documentation for the collection. And it's a really interesting collection because it was led by white educated men who were interviewing single mothers living on welfare. Um, so there's quite a contrast between the interviewees and the interviewers, which kind of raises some eyebrows for me. But then you read a piece like this in the documentation and you think that's actually really, really interesting context to show the kind of positionality the research team took toward its participants. Annette Lawson's study, Adultery and Analysis of Love and Betrayal, was a project that was conducted in the 1980s, and it was exploring the really taboo topic, at the time anyway, of adultery, of cheating. Um, and as such, it was really hard to recruit participants. So Lawson chose to put out a call for participants in a newspaper. But this created an arguably biased sample of mostly white, middle-class women who were responding to her call for participants. So as such, she was a bit preoccupied with the sample and ended up writing a 54 page defense of her sample. So she starts here with a discussion on the ethical conundrums that arose from the sampling strategy, including jealous partners who were sending in information about their married partners to participate, or there was another man who called from a psychiatric ward. And then she moved on here to an extensive comparison between her sample and the national population, exploring what was a significant difference between the national population and um, whether or not this would impact um, her data. And finally, um, she kind of lands on some very interesting theoretical conclusions about sampling strategies more broadly, including the point that sampling needs to match the context of the study and that exploratory studies such as hers are benefited from a greater focus on the ability to talk about the topic in detail rather than a focus on the participants. Earlier, I had an example of interviewer notes, but field notes might potentially also be another example of quite detailed documentation. So field notes are a little bit different in that Again, they sort of occupy this gray space between being both data and documentation at different times. Um, it's worth pointing out that documentation is normally something that's openly available um, unless it's embedded in with the data. So you may need to think about if you are going to include field notes, um, whether or not there needs to be some access restrictions on those. Uh, we only have about half a dozen collections of um, examples with field notes like this, and almost all of them are from ethnographic studies. So it's not something we normally get, but again, could be included as really important context. And there are new possibilities with changing technology. So um, I'm thinking specifically of qualitative studies where you have computer-assisted qualitative analysis software programs like Envivo, which will allow you to download your code books and memos, um, even mind maps. So you can see a list of nodes here with their descriptions, all very easily downloadable. Um, when we received the Edwardians collection that I gave the example of the image of, that contained 453 80 plus page interviews of British residents who were um, born during the Edwardian period. And it was accompanied by all of this work done by hand. So there were 16 shelves dedicated to the coding of those transcripts into key themes. 
But now, of course, you can download that in a single file at any point during or after coding. The same with creating um, sort of code books from, from SPSS files. It just, um, some of that software just makes it much easier um, to create that documentation. Um, research teams have also used blogs and websites. Um, so it might be part of the research process of keeping in touch with participants, um, about updates on the progress of the research. There might be posts um, of information for participants or even call outs for participants. Once that project is done, that site can then sit alongside the project as a related resource. And again, just provides a little bit of additional documentation. We also see more creative documentation too, such as this photo story. Again, this sort of thing is classed as potentially data, um, but there is certainly a lot of scope to use audio files or video files to accompany your data. Um, so you can perhaps talk through um, your research process and deposit uh, that uh, as documentation. Um, and finally, changing technology is not just about how research is done, but also how we archive. So the UK Data Service has created QualiBank, which is an online tool for searching, browsing, and citing qualitative data. And as part of this, you can search and view qualitative data online, but then also view the linked documentation. So this documentation relates to specific data rather than the collection as a whole. Um, and it allows for the distinction between project level documentation and data level documentation. So you can associate it with specific interviews or, or um, essays, for example, um, or images. Um, we don't really have the equivalent for quantitative um, in terms of relating to specific um, data files, um, but it is a nice kind of tool that, that we're using within the UK Data Service for archiving qualitative collections. And finally, in addition to user guides and any other kind of related resources you might have, we also have README files. So this file usually contains information about how the data was prepared for ingest into the archive. Um, within the archive, this file can be automatically generated and edited, um, but you know, you'd need to just double check how it's done. Um, so this is one that we've generated for our own curation processes. And if you ever have um, archived with us, you would have been asked to write some sort of readme file about the data processing um, and preparation for archiving. Okay, oh, sorry, I keep skipping through. Um, so we've got one more activity to do. Um, so Emma's gonna pop another couple of um, uh, links, oh, sorry, the first link, Emma, just the first link in the chat. And you'll see that it's an interview extract. And what I'd like you to do with this interview extract is try and guess what is the participant's age and what year was the interview taken? And I'm going to give you until um, uh, 11, 13, so 10 minutes to read through this. It's not terribly long. It's a, a page and a half of interview extract, but it is a phonetic transcription. So it is a bit of a challenge to read, um, but it might also give you some ideas um, having been a phonetic uh, transcription. So I'll leave that with you for a bit to read through and think about, can you, you know, based on the data you have there, can you guess the participant's age or what year the interview was taken um, and see, see what you can garner from just the data. All right, hopefully you've had some time to read through the um, read through the transcript. Um, does anyone want to put some guesses into the chat of what age you think the participant is and what year you think the interview was taken? Age 86, year 92, it's a good guess. I think mine probably would have been quite similar um, given the information that was in the transcript there. Late 70s, early 2000s, done in the early 2000s. Yep. So we're getting some similar kind of answers here, potentially in the 90s to 2000s, somebody in their 70s, 80s. 
age 92. Okay. Lovely. Um, Emma, do you mind just popping in the next link? And the next link has the context here. So from this context, we can see that this interview was conducted in 1978, and the age of that grandmother was 43, which is a little bit frightening to me. <laughs> um, 43 doesn't seem that far away, and is not the kind of um, age that I think of when I think of a grandmother. Um, so the, the point of this activity um, is just to kind of drive home why documentation and some of that context is so important. Um, if we just had the data, just the transcript, it gives you a very different kind of flavor of what the research was and, and what, what people were um, trying to achieve with it um, than when you are given that documentation as well. Um, so having some of that metadata, the dates of the field work, the age of participants, um, and, and anything else, you know, just kind of adds to your understanding of what the limitations and opportunities are of the data. And as I kind of said early, earlier, it also may make you kind of consider your own positionality in relation to the data. So I think of my grandmother. So my kind of answer, I probably would have said 70s, 80s um, and, and an older interview, but not, you know, uh, probably I probably would have said the 90s as well. So um, it, that probably says more about me and, and my conceptions of these things than it than it does about the data itself. Um, so it, it serves as a useful reminder as well, I think. Um, but hopefully that kind of exercise drives home how important metadata is. So we are just wrapping up here. I just need another two minutes, just some concluding remarks about, um, you know, uh, documentation and, and just a little um, checklist that we've got. So when you deposit your documentation, that does become an output. Um, and that is something that can be reused. Um, so we have, for example, hundreds of examples of consent forms, information sheets. Um, so rather than writing some of these things from scratch, you can search through our documentation and where you see something that you think is good practice, you can absolutely reuse that. And then in your publications, if you do mention these sorts of things, just make sure that you reference back um, to that user guide and cite the user guide for that. Um, we also have things like interview topics and, and survey questionnaires. So I supervise um, dissertation students, and before they go out to design their own topic guides um, and surveys, I ask them to look at the documentation for collections that are broadly about similar topics that they're researching and see what kinds of questions have been asked and how they've been asked and what kind of language is used. Um, and I think it's a, it's a really useful way to kind of reuse some of that documentation as well. Um, we do see some interesting reuse cases of some of our documentation. So um, one collection, which is not the one you see here, it's called the Foot and Mouth Disease in North Cumbria. Um, they deposited their interview guides, which was later reused by medical students um, to understand doctor-patient dynamics. Um, so it was a really interesting reuse of that documentation. You might also think about um, doing research with uh, groups that can be either difficult or hard to reach. Um, or just generally, we don't do a lot of research on. So I'm thinking of um, people with disabilities or doing research with children or, or other sort of quote unquote vulnerable groups. I know that's problematic language, but um, if we think of uh, that kind of research um, and you might feel at a loss of how do I even begin to create some of the research materials that are needed? Again, we have some excellent collections that have already done this before. So you can look at what they've done um, and perhaps pick up some good practices there. Um, and finally, just a like a data sharing checklist, some of the mandatory documentation that we ask for. So always check with your archive or repository what their gu guidelines are. 
when creating your documentation file, so you don't have to remake anything, there might already be some templates available, such as, for example, our data list or our readme files. You can use the templates that we already have if you're depositing with us. Um, when you fill in your data offer or your data deposit form, try and fill in with as much detail as possible, and that will allow the archive to create machine-readable metadata. Um, and when you're filling out our data deposit form, you'll find there is some controlled vocabulary there. So using that controlled vocabulary because it will help um, kind of create uh, a, a more findable collection. But also ensure your data files have that data level documentation too, can be really useful. Even if, for example, you're doing qualitative work and you have a set of interview transcripts, that little bit of context right at the beginning of the, the gender and the, the um, age and the region, you know, some of that information can really help contextualize the data um, for any reusers. Um, we have lots of tools and templates that I said are available. Um, so, you know, have a look at those. You can have access to these slides if you go back to the event page and you can click on those. Um, if you wanna see what some of those look like, um, those are available to use and reuse, um, modify and, and make it your own for your own project. And if you're interested in a little bit more information about metadata, about the FAIR principles, or um, any kind of documentation, here's um, some further resources as well to kind of explore a bit. So we have our own learning hub on research data management, as well as the CESDA. Um, this is the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives. They also have an expert um, guide that they've put out. Um, we've published a book, Managing and Sharing Data, Best Practices for Researchers. So um, you, can, you can go to the text as well, um, so on and so forth. Here's our, here's our book. Um, so uh, you can have a look at that. And of course we do offer lots of training as well. So we're kind of revamping some of these. So I've taken off the names of them um, because some of these are changing. But I did one last week on anonymization uh, for social science research data. We also have ethical and legal considerations for research. Um, we do some spotlights on specific kinds of data that we hold within our archive. So I do one on qualitative and mixed methods, but some of my colleagues will um, talk a little bit more about specific types of, of quantitative data that we hold, including some of our longitudinal series, um, some of the kind of business um, data that we hold, uh, so on and so forth. I think there's a specific one on understanding society as well, for those of you who are interested in that um, particular collection. We also host computational um, computer scientist drop-in sessions. So if you are a budding computer scientist, um, you know you can meet up with Jules and talk through um, some of the work that you're doing. Um, we also hold conferences based around some of the collections that we hold. Um, so have a look at our events page. And you can get in touch with us as well. So um, we're on social media, um, we're on YouTube. If you want to look at at uh, some of the past training events that we've that we've hosted, if you're interested in the anonymization one, I think that one that recording should be up now too. Um, so check us out on social media, and that's everything. Bye, everyone.